Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to the first Surface Sessions of 2016. Yay! You join us here on a, a beautiful, sunny and a bit chilly Norfolk morning. Today, we're looking at the WIFO Corp Remo Finger. When I first glimpsed this device back in some of the NAM coverage, I was immediately taken with it. The image of an iPad with what looked like patch cables coming off it was just far too cool to pass by. And it rang all the bells of my personal interest in creative computer control. Using a foot controller with a PC though, of course, is, is nothing new. I've been doing it for decades. Back at Carillon, I designed a system that was based around a Behringer MIDI foot controller to control the original version of Amplitube. It took a lot of messing about with MIDI ox to repatch stuff and create control scripts and all sorts of nonsense to get it to work. Of course, the MIDI learning facilities indoors these days are much more comprehensive, and so it's easier to set up, although there's still plenty of messing about to be had. More recently, Bluetooth pedal boards have offered a wireless way of controlling software. IK Multimedia's iRig Blue Board is a perfect way of controlling their own Amplitude app. All you've got to do is marry up the Bluetooth devices, map the foot switches, and you're on your way. None of this is difficult, but it does require a fair bit of setting up, and it's all dependent on what the software you want to use can actually do in terms of MIDI mapping. So what does the Remo Finger offer that these other things can't? The most important difference with the Remo Finger is that it can provide instant control over any button or function that you can see and tap without any editing, any setup, any driver installation. It'll work on any touchscreen, any phone, any tablet, any hybrid, any all-in-one, and any OS, and any piece of software. You want a foot switch to print a document in Word? No problem. You want to select different tools in Photoshop with your feet? This is what you need. How does it do it? Well, it does it through these sort of remarkable patch cable sucker things. You find the button you want to press, you stick this on it, and then you can control it with your foot. Because this little fella literally, literally taps the screen for you. That's the, the technology. It's a, it's a sort of electronic tapping device. It's sort of crazy, but also wildly useful. And that sort of neatly sums up the device, really. It's a mixture of craziness and usefulness, kind of coolness and not so coolness. But is it cool enough? Is it useful enough? Well, let's go and find out. First of all, I should say that I'm going to be reviewing and demoing this on the Surface Pro 3 and the Surface 3. I'm not going to be using the Surface Pro 4. My Surface Pro 4 has arrived. Isn't she beautiful? But I've had a few problems running the two together, which I don't have the time to look into just now. So at the moment, I can't recommend this for the Surface Pro 4. However, that will hopefully change and I will certainly put notes all over this video and in the description and everywhere else in the world if and when that happens. But for the moment, I'm going to concentrate on the Surface Pro 3 with which it works beautifully and the Surface 3 and we'll go with that. So let me talk you through the hardware. Well, my first impression was like, wow, I love that logo. It's so kind of retro and awesome, but of course it's just the logo for WIFO Corporation who make the Remo Finger G. My second impression is then that, oh, it's a shame it's made of plastic. Yeah, but it is decent plastic. I mean, it has some weight to it. It's certainly rigid enough and the buttons feel like you could give them plenty of stomps and it's gonna survive. I mean, I guess similar devices are all plastic. Bluetooth stuff tends to be really sort of flimsy plastic. And so for under a hundred quid, it's not unexpected, but it would have been lovely had it been a metal case. The other part of the Remo Finger is the console, which is this, and that rather neatly fits in the bottom like so. And your little cables you can store in here, which is a really nice design. I like that. So all you've got to do is take this part away, stick it in your bag, and you've got everything you need. Ta-da! So how does the hardware work? Well, these two things are connected by some form of magic, and you have these four foot switches that you press that correspond to four sort of holes for the patch cables here. These then plug in 
to the corresponding what's it you press the foot switch this goes tap 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 on your screen button works awesomeness that's the general idea so let me demonstrate that quickly on there it's all battery driven batteries haven't run out yet I've had it for a couple of weeks I'm just going to stick that on the start button there it's in A I press A the start menu appears press it again it goes away press it it appears press it it goes away is that mad well uh, I suppose so well, also it's really very interesting so the Rima figure was designed with the iPad in mind and so this is supposed to go on any side of the top or the side uh, of an iPad, which is fine. But with the Surface, you've got this kickstand in the way. So that prevents you from putting it in most places. So I can't put it here because it hits the, the kickstand. I can't put it here because of the cables and power supply. So it kind of just leaves me this side here. But this sort of grip bit here works very well. It's just sort of enough grip to keep it on and to work well. Now, of course, being designed for the iPad, these are gonna be the perfect size for all the sort of touchy-feely buttons that the iPad gives you. The Surface, on the other hand, runs both touch and non-touch software. It runs stuff which is designed for fingers and stuff which is designed for mice and tiny little movements. And so it's gonna bring with it a few challenges, shall we say, and we're gonna to have to play a bit with the scaling to make it all work. But let's look at a couple examples and see how it goes. Well, the most obvious place to start then is with some guitar software, as this is definitely marketed at the guitarist. And the best place for that is IK Multimedia's Amplitube. Now, IK have their own Bluetooth pedal board for running with their own Amplitude app on iOS or on the Mac, but there's nothing for Windows users. So once again, they, they're not really thinking of us particularly. So this is the perfect scenario for the Remo finger. So looking at amplitude then, it's really, really small, which could be a bit of a problem. Let's turn on the stomps and have a look. Struggling here to, uh, to hit a button. So there's our four stomp boxes. Now we could scale it up in Windows, which we'll do in a minute, but for the moment I just want to show one of the drawbacks, I suppose, uh, of this technology. So if I put this in A here, Stick that on the first pedal. Take another one. Put that one on the second. Third. And fourth. Now, that's either a look that you're gonna love or you're just gonna think is bonkers. I've kind of made a, an active decision that I'm going to love it. So <laughs> that's, that's the way I'm approaching it at this stage. But you can see uh, from this, this camera down here that you can, you know, the, the pedals are obscured. You can't, you can't see the button. You can't see whether something is on or off. So I can press these and it's not really gonna give you an indication of what's going on. Although on the screamer here, the LED is actually at the top. So you can see that one turn on and off. But the other ones, you cannot because the pointer sucker touchy thing is covering the information. Now, Rima Finger have thought about this and they've given you one sort of solution built in and that's where you can toggle these LEDs on or off because there's no actual two-way communication going on. There's nothing, there's no connection that will tell the Remo Finger what's going on in the software, but you can set it. So I know that that's on for the screamer so I can use these buttons here to turn the LED on. To match. Yeah, see, simple, genius. Uh, the other ones I better check with the uh, with the help of the guitar. So the, the delay appears to be on. That's off. So I'm going to change the LED on that. The chorus. Okay, that's on. So that's on. So that's now on off. So that's everything off. That's everything off again. So even without seeing the information, you can still set it up 
so that it works. And if you're a guitarist, you're not going to be looking necessarily at the readout of your effects all the time. You're just going to want to be knowing if they're on or off. However, because the controls are there, because the effects are there and accessible, you really want to be able to use them and to see what's going on in more detail. And so for that, we're going to have to make Amplitube larger. Now, in this world of high resolution, small screens, this is going to increasingly become a problem. And manufacturers really need to grab hold of this and start making their GUIs in, available in a few different sizes. So for instance, on the Surface Pro 4 or on the Surface Book that have a higher resolution again, Amplitube is going to be tiny. IK Multimedia and others as well need to get their act together and start producing scalable interfaces. That's going to become very important, I think. So in here, let's uh, take it out of tablet mode so I can get to the desktop. Let's get to display settings. Let's pull that all the way to the right. Close that down. That's so much better. Also, did you notice that Windows 10 allows you to scale without having to log out and log back in again, in most cases. And that's just how it should be, really. So here throws up the next kind of flaw in all of it is that if you move the window or resize the window, your touchy pointy thingies are no longer on the right buttons. Hmm. So if you're doing something, you've got it all set up and then you move the window, it's all going to be for nothing. But then why would you do that? If you set this up to use it, you're not then going to move the window around or put something else in front of it. Or if you do, well then, you know, you've created your own problem. But it's certainly true that the physicality of it all, you know, is a factor. So probably at this point, the most important thing is going to be simply to play. So let's put this fella on the floor, grab my guitar. <laughs> See, one of the, the, the awesome things about having a touch interface, whether it's an iPad or a Surface or whatever, is from a guitarist point of view, I'm playing these sounds and I can just reach a finger out and change them. You know, I'm not having to find a mouse or find a trackpad or mess about like you'd have to on a Mac or a non-touch PC, I can just reach out and I can change whatever knob I lay my fingers on. That combined... Combined with this is pretty awesome, I think. Samitude has another feature which is interesting and useful for these little fellas. And that's the looper. Now, this is essentially a, a for loop looper that lets you record and then it'll instantly play it back so you can add another bit in order to layer stuff on top of each other. It's an awesome thing. I'm completely rubbish at it. I have my hands, feet, brain sort of uh, coordination is, is terrible. However, in the right hands, in the right feet, this is an awesome function. So let me demonstrate it poorly for you. I mean, again, we're having this, the same sort of theme where this is going to be over the top of some of the things we need to see, but not so much because the ring works really well. And you can tell whether it's green or whether it's red and that kind of thing. We're going to stick A on there, B on there, C, D. That just looks fantastic to me, I have to say. I'm going to stick the metronome on because it's the only way I'm going to cope with this. And we're going to go uh, vertical again over here. Right, are you ready for a, a little bit of, of awesome horribleness? Let's give it a go.
and then of course you can uh, stop bits in and out Yeah, you get, you get the idea, I think. So with a few years of practice, I think that could actually end up being quite nice. So how does it feel? Well, there is a little bit of latency going on. I guess that's the, the nature of the wirelessness and the mechanics that actually has to go through the system in order to press something. But I'm not necessarily convinced it's any more or less than a Bluetooth device in particular. And being a guitarist, you sort of tend to adapt to that kind of thing. Because often, particularly when using digital effects, they're not always as instantaneous as perhaps you'd like. And there's all sorts of travel involved in the pedal and the turning the on and off and all, and all that kind of thing. So it is there, but it's not so noticeable as to make the thing unusable. The second obvious usage is with uh, page turning. Page turning for sheet music and chord sheets and that sort of thing. I get asked about this a lot. And the one that I found to be, I don't know if it's the best, but it seems to be the most fully featured is Music Reader from musicreader.net. For this example, I've now picked up my Surface 3, the little one, just to show it working on there for a change. It's very simple. You load up a piece of music as a PDF and then you tap on one side and it goes to a different page. You can view it as a two page layout or a single page layout, or an extended page, whatever you like, whatever works for you. So with this, all we need is uh, a finger on either side. So let's get, which one is this, D, we'll stick D over here, we'll stick A over here. And then at the push of a foot switch, you are moving through the music. So as you're, as you're playing, playing or playing, you can very easily control where you are completely electronically, wirelessly, beautifully, without any setup or worrying about installation. It's awesome, right? Yeah, awesome. Absolutely brilliant. Couldn't be simpler, couldn't be easier. I just, I just love that. Now I'm yet to see any sort of music management software like this available as a Windows 10 app. This is a piece of desktop software. There was one recently that came along, but it required a swipe to turn the page, so made it completely useless, unfortunately. But hopefully more things like that will come along. But if not, then this works. Music Reader do actually also sell their own USB foot switch for it, which is, which is cool. But, you know, it's about £100 for something which is specific to a single piece of software. It's like the IK uh, Blue Board as well. It's been specific to a single piece of software. Whereas a Remo Finger will work with blooming anything. Just while we're here, I just also want to have a look at the stand feature of the console here. Because you see this long bit. Well, the long bit is there to give it a little bit of sturdiness for when you rest your tablet get this unknotted into this little groove here, which works brilliantly for the Surface 3. Obviously, it's designed for the iPad. So let's have a quick look at that. <clears throat> yes, I know, I have an iPad. Don't we all? It's just one of those things that seems to appear Ta -da, perfectly. But one thing I'd like to point out, which is really cool with the Surface, is that you can actually have it in both orientations with the iPad, it doesn't work. It sits in there and then it escapes. That's no good. With the Surface, once I've closed the kickstand, turn a portrait mode, awesome. So I can do the same thing, stick me stickers on the sticker thing. And now I can go through as a full page like a proper sheet of music, you know, nice and big and large and everything. It looks weird this way up, but that, that totally works and that's totally secure. Actually, the bigger ones will do it too. If I get out the Pro 3. Yep, 
Yeah, completely sorted. With the Surface Pro 3, the volume control is on this side bit here. With the others, the Surface 3 and the Surface Pro 4, it's actually along the top, which means working in portrait mode is a little trickier on the Surface Pro 3 because of the volume being here. But for the others, it's no problem. But that, you know, it's there. It's working. It does the job. You can do it with the 4 as well. This way up. Now the 4 Surface Pro 4 is a little bit thinner, so it gives you this rather alarming kind of rake, this, alarm, this alarming angle to itself, which, you know, it's a 1200 quid piece of kit and I'm just not quite sure whether I completely trust that. iPads are a bit more disposable. But anyway, what you would probably do, in all fairness, is you would sit that on your music stand and you would sit that next to it or you'd put it on the side like that rather than using that as a stand. But particularly if you're using it this way around, it works brilliantly as a stand. So that's a bonus, if you like, a bonus feature with the Remo Finger. So one of the things I was most keen to try with the Remo Finger was clip recording in Bitwig Studio. In my review, I mentioned how you're not able to set the length of an audio clip which made recording guitar on the fly are quite troublesome. In the end, I rigged up a sustain pedal going through the base station keyboard, MIDI mapped to trigger a, an audio clip, which when record enabled would allow you to start recording on one press and then stop recording on the next press. Although you couldn't actually set it up like that exactly. It was a kind of a, it was kind of a fudge. And I know that doesn't make a great deal of sense, but that was the best that I could do in working out how to record guitar as I was playing it in Bitquid Studio. So when I saw this, I instantly thought, ha ha, I can trigger the recording of an audio clip with this, and then I could trigger another one, and then I could trigger another one. It seemed like the perfect device, and that's one of the reasons I got so excited about it. Now, unfortunately, when I first got this, I instantly ran into a problem. When you attach a pointer to a clip in Bitwig and then hit it, it didn't actually trigger it. Instead, what triggered was the radial menu, like so. It was as if that the tap was just being held on too long. And instead of triggering a clip by tapping it, like so, it was tapping and holding a little bit, just enough for it to bring up the radial menu, the wonderful radial menu, but in this instance, the really annoying radial menu. So I spoke to WIFO Corp about this and they rustled me up a completely new version and sent it out, which is awesome. And so what they've done is introduced a new mode. If I turn it off, and turn it on again, holding this button, It should now be working on a slightly quicker tap in order to make this work. Is this still connected? It is. So now it no longer comes up with the menu. It now triggers that correctly, which is awesome. So uh, yeah, just through me complaining about it, they totally went out, reworked it, sent me a new version that has a, a firmware updated in it thing with a switch with a what's it. You know, <laughs> that's fantastic. I wonder what else I can complain about. So now, thankfully, Bitwig is awesome with the Remo finger. Let me see if I can demonstrate this. So let's just get rid of that. So obviously I can put anything anywhere and that'll enable me to trigger that loop. Or an entire scene. which is all 
great and marvelous and wonderful stuff. But what I wanted it for was to, on the fly, record a guitar riff and then let that loop back and then change that if you want to let that loop back. You could, of course, set it up onto different tracks and different channels, which could be interesting. But let's just try to keep it simple and together at the moment. I mean, one thing that this highlights here, as I'm trying to move these around, is that these are, of course, all the same color and look all the same. There was some previous marketing and some videos on their website where these are all different colors. There were like red and yellow and green and, and blue, which actually I think would be much better because then I could associate a color with A, B, C and D and I would have a much better job identifying which is which. But as it is, I've got to keep faffing around. All right, so that's that's D, that's fine. So let's stick that down there. And see it there. So now, of course, if I wanted to, to trigger a particular loop somewhere, and I went, oh, let's go over here and trigger that one. That's fine, but now I've lost the placement of me pointing things. So how am I going to work all that out? Well, I just put it back to where it was, obviously. It's not a big thing, really. So let's um, see if I can make this work. Record enable. Yeah, do you see that? Do you see what I did there? With that, you can kind of see what I'm getting at. So there are definitely instances in live performance where I would want to add a guitar loop or a vocal refrain or something just to add to what's going on, uh, to layer it in and to leave that playing. And to be able to do that sort of effortlessly without having to set up any complicated routing or MIDI mapping or controller, I've just got to stick the thing on and then pump the pedal. You do have to be careful though about windows moving around or uh, changing focus. So for instance, I run video software at the same time. So I'd have to be careful to make sure that Bitwig is back in focus. Otherwise nothing's going to happen. And those, if those clips drift from underneath the suckers, then it's not going to really work out very well, but you have to work to prevent that eventuality. <laughs> Nothing is ever quite perfect though, and there are a couple of issues. I mean, the first one, as I mentioned, is the lack of color on the patch cables means that I'm not really sure which is which most of the time. And having those colored patch cables would really sort that out, which kind of leads me into my second issue, which is that they can fall off. I mean, funny enough, they've never actually fallen off when I'm using it. It's usually when I go away to do something else and then come back a little while later and they're all gathered at the bottom here which again because they're all the same color means you've got to work out which is which you know maybe they need a lick maybe my screen needs a clean 
or something. I'm not entirely sure, but I can imagine it would be pretty annoying if you had a sound check and had everything set up and then went off to get a beer and to come back and find that all these little suckers had fallen off. Let's have a quick dart around some other software to see if it's going to work. Now in stage light it can work, but what you have is you have the record button here and the play button over here. So if I go to record on here, so I can set that recording to three. See, that works nicely. But if I press stop, then the play button is actually over here, not underneath this button anymore, which is record again. So I would either need to have to move it, or I'd need to have two on the one thing like that. Now this is scaled pretty much as high as it will go, I think. No, I can make it go higher. Like that. But even so, it's still, it's difficult to make that sit over a single thing. And also I'm gonna to have to sit it over the play button. So yeah, it, it works fine, it's just that I can't get two of these next to each other, so I'm not going to be able to trigger two different scenes. I could, however, record, I think, if I record enable, yeah. So yeah, Ableton Live is definitely a possibility working within the restrictions of, uh, of, of the size of the clips. I mean, in any other bits of software like Cubase, Pro Tools, Studio One, etc., then it's going to work fine as a transport control. They don't really have a sort of a, a loop or clip function to allow you to, to trigger and, and record straight in, but you could easily set up a track for recording uh, and hit record on this in order to start recording your guitar. The other one worth trying is Guitar Rig. Now, this again suffers from not really being touch friendly and so the buttons and stuff are, are not particularly helpful. So in order to turn an effect on and off on here, you're kind of looking at that button there, I suppose. That's off, that's on. But there's very little there to tell you that you've done anything. I mean, this one over here, that does seem to, there we go. That has a light on it, which is being a bit more helpful, but I'm not entirely sure that I'm really hitting on the on off button. Is there a bypass somewhere or some other thing? Not really. That's why the stomp box thing in, uh, in Amplitude is so much better suited to this sort of thing than Guitar Rig. Guitar Rig is, works in a different way, uh, give, presents the effects in a different way. It's not particularly touch friendly. The knobs are, you know, all work fine and stuff, but it's these on off bits that are not really gonna work out. But you know, who knows, make it work. Make it work for yourself. That's what I say. So here's another completely fabulous idea. Why not use this to control four tablets? Proof of concept. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? I have no idea. But you can. 
yeah, something told me the first time I saw it that I would love this thing. And I do. I was so crushed when I couldn't get it to work with Bitwig the first time around. But, you know, unbelievably, the communication with WIFO Corp has been amazing. They've been so ready and eager and, you know, keen to sort me out. I mean, I'm not even their target market. Their target market is the iPad user. I'm a Surface user. I'm kind of doing all the things I hadn't really thought of. But maybe that's what makes me interested. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, the, the work that they did to get me another one uh, that did what I needed to do was just awesome. That's just fantastic. I wish more manufacturers would pay that amount of attention to what's going on. So now I'm just, you know, looking for excuses to use it really. I think if you're a, I think if you're a software guitarist particularly, then it's the sort of thing you have to have. So you could fire up your effects at any time and just dunk one of the pointers on a button and, and you're away. You're not having to mess about with setting stuff up. And that's why it's good. I do love the whole patch cable thing. I think there's definitely a future coming where we can start patching in analog synths to tablets. I know this has got nothing to do with this because this is just doing tapping, but you know, you could, I can imagine, for instance, that you could have a, a, a flashing on your tablet that could have an opto sensor stuck on it, which then trails off to control some kind of analog synth and have all that sort of stuff starting to mesh together. And I think the look of the Remo finger kind of throws those ideas up in the air instantly, which I find fascinating, which hasn't got anything to do with this particularly, but I'm just talking here. So anyway, yeah, the Remo finger, love it. Go and check it out. It's out there now, it's about $150. You can order one from the website and it arrives in no time at all. That's it for today. I've got a load of stuff coming on the Surface Pro 4 very, very soon, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, go make more tunes.